one. Christian, the stage is yours. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, hello, everybody. Good evening um, to our Ansible meetup. Um, my name is Christian Jung. I am a uh, product expert for Ansible at Red Hat. And um, before I start with the actual presentation, I would like to ask you to give me a little bit of uh, feedback about how skilled you actually are with Ansible. So if you could just uh, put into the chat, if you are a beginner, so you heard of it, you might have written like the, the typical hello world, install a web server thing, or maybe you are more advanced, uh, you have written roles and collections, or maybe you're an expert, uh, you know, just write beginner, advanced or expert into the chat. I will give you a minute to do that and uh, I will um, have a quick uh, look after the next slide. So with that, um, a little bit about myself, um, Christian Jung, as I said, um, I'm your typical friendly nerd doing everything Linux and open source and IT in general. I'm a Red Hatter since uh, 2006. I joined as an infrastructure consultant and uh, did different roles within Red Hat and started my journey with Ansible in uh, 2016. That was about a year after the acquisition of Ansible. And it's my full-time job basically since about two years. So my role is basically to help customers and partners in uh, successfully using and implementing Ansible and an automation strategy. Um, I'm also the technical expert for, for people in, within Red Hat. If they have a question, if they want to know how it works or how to position it or uh, have a competitive situation or something like that. So me and uh, the members of, of my team are basically supposed to, to you know, have uh, answers to everything Ansible. And, uh, you know, people always ask about fun facts. So I guess what's a little bit interesting about myself is uh, I had the uh, fortunate situation that I was uh, living for two years in Malta. Um, I only had like two minutes to the beach and uh, that was quite nice. So you can always go for a swim between the breaks and uh, uh, sorry, between the meetings and stuff or in the evening. So that was quite fun. So let me quickly check in the chat what people were writing. Advanced, advanced, beginner, beginner. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, small addition. Yeah. I I, I haven't edited the chat <laughs> because I'm currently recording. Um, uh, I, I think in, in your schema, I'm considered an expert, but uh, only at the beginner stage. <laughs> so contributed five or six times to the upstream, written a couple of modules. Um, but on the other hand, uh, is, there, is there some some real expert here in our group already or was it only advanced because i cannot review the I, chat. I only saw a beginner and advanced oh okay cool so everybody is learning something yeah. <laughs> which is actually good because yeah. i guess if you're an expert you will probably be bored about this presentation because you already know that stuff um, okay, um, the first thing I want to do today is talk a little bit about collections. Uh, collections are, as you hopefully know, not really new, but they are kind of important because they influence a couple of the things we're seeing. Uh, so uh, a couple of the new stuff, which I'm talking about later, is um, based on the work we have done about Ansible collections. So, I thought it might be a good idea to recap that a little bit. Uh, so by starting, what was the situation? What was the problem or the challenge we were trying to solve with uh, the introduction of collections? And there have been a couple of reasons. So one of, for example, was that um, Ansible was growing and growing and, and super successful. And that's, of course, a good thing. But when a project becomes uh, very large, um, it, it becomes more difficult to get all the expectations and demands under control. And one problem we have seen a lot of times, uh, me also in particular, is that it was quite difficult for people to understand 
uh, who is supporting which module, what kind of support can I expect, where should I report an issue, where would I put a PR. Um, some things are moving very quickly. I'm always using the cloud ex providers as an example. It feels like they have a new API or functionality pretty much every week. So that's moving very quickly, while other areas are probably moving much slower. So that is already introducing some friction on how to get all those things aligned. And then, of course, for the upstream developers, it also became an increasing challenge to keep track with all the the changes, you know, at a certain point in time, there were more than 4,000 open issues. There were a couple of thousand of pull requests. Um, I also had people who were saying, oh, there is an issue open for two years and nobody's looking at it. Well, maybe because they just don't have the time, you know, they're also just humans, right? So there's a limit on what you can do. And then again, also in the upstream project, um, things are moving with different pace. Um, also, with with this growth, there's a literal growth also on the disk usage, and uh, especially with, with our customers, are some customers very concerned about uh, how large an operating system image is. And if we can shrink it, they would always appreciate it. And Ansible uh, became increasingly larger and will probably continue to grow. So we needed uh, some way of handling these different uh, development speeds, but also, you know, making those different needs uh, realistically possible. And uh, the solution which was basically developed is to, to break things up or was to break things up. So we split what uh, we typically call the Ansible project into uh, the content and the core. And the core is basically just everything you need to run an Ansible playbook. And the content is, uh, you know, the modules, the plugins, uh, uh, the filters, and all those kind of things. But again, of course, we want to make sure that existing users are still happy. And one of the reasons why Ansible got so popular and grew so quickly is that the idea of uh, batteries included. So when you install Ansible, you don't have to search for uh, different sources to get your modules and plugins and uh, filters and whatever. You basically have everything already there. You just do your installation of Ansible and you have thousands of modules available and you can get started quickly. And of course, we still wanted to keep that. So for the end user, um, the change is actually um, as little as possible. It should have been as least disruptive for Ansible users, and they should ideally uh, just be able to update your Ansible version and continue to use the playbooks they have been developing and using. And uh, for them, the, the change should have been as little as possible. Um, what this helps us to do is basically also to allow new features and bug fixes more quickly. When we look back at previous releases of Ansible, uh, so we are using here the time frame between 2.5 and 2.6, but that's just an example. So there's always you know, a time span between Ansible releases. There is a new bug, which you probably found a couple of weeks after the release. Or maybe there's a new feature, again, picking on the public cloud providers. They have a new functionality. Uh, you want to bring that out as quickly as possible. But now you have to maybe wait three, four, five months until the next Ansible release is shipped. And people are desperately waiting for this feature. So this is the kind of situation we were trying to solve with the introduction of uh, collections. Because now what we can do if you find a bug or if there is a new feature you want to implement or a new improvement in your module, you can basically decide on your own when you ship the new collection. You can um, decouple that from the Ansible release schedule. If you say, I don't know, I'm writing modules for a public cloud provider and I feel confident to have a new release every two weeks, you can now do that. You don't have to wait for Ansible to release something new. You can do it whenever you feel like you want to. So this is the big change 
which we have um, actually seen over the last two years or so. Uh, but it's also a foundation for a couple of new stuff uh, which, uh, which is coming and which I will spend the most part of the presentation today. Before I'm going to that, I just want to spend also a, a minute on uh, terminology. Um, so this uh, separation basically brings us a new thing, which is called the Ansible Core, um, it, which is currently 2.11.3, which is again, you know, just the stuff to, to make the language and the framework work. It has the minimum set of modules and plugins, basically only the stuff you need to make Ansible work but none of the uh, collections and modules and plugins you might have seen in the past. For a very short time frame, we also had Ansible Base, but that was renamed to uh, Ansible Core. So Ansible Core is the, the name you have to remember. Ansible Base, if somebody asks you about that, that was 2.10 and after that it was renamed. But again, we still have Ansible. We, we usually just call it Ansible. Sometimes it's called the community distribution or kind of different ways of naming it, but typically we just say Ansible. And that's basically following the tradition of what we used to know with Ansible, the batteries included. It's currently 4.4, so you have all the thousands of modules and you just get started and you don't, if you're just using Ansible, you don't even have to know about all these changes and maybe you can even ignore them. They might not be really relevant for what you're doing. So today we have Ansible 4.4. Last time I checked, there were more than 6,000 modules. So again, and, and we continue to see that growth, Ansible is really about making things easy and uh, get you started as, as easily as possible. Uh, but still, of course, people can uh, publish their content in other ways. Uh, maybe they don't want to or they don't have the time commitment to get it upstream as part of the uh, project. Uh, they can make their content available on Ansible Galaxy. Ansible Galaxy is basically the community marketplace where everybody can sign up and publish the content, make it available to others. Uh, originally, it was focused on roles, but now it also has support for collections, so you can uh, distribute co your collections there as well. There is a second marketplace um, exclusively for Red Hat customers, which we call the Automation Hub. And the main difference is, uh, is very simple. It's just about support and certification and testing. So the Content Auto Automation Hub is actually much, much less than you will see on Galaxy. Um, but the advantage for enterprise customers is that this content is certified and tested and supported by Red Hat and, and the partner. But still, everything is open source. And actually, I would say pretty much all of it you will also find on Ansible Galaxy or on GitHub. It's not, it's not a fork or anything like that. It's just an extra, I would say, insurance for enterprise customers. And that was, like I said, you know, just a, a bit of an introduction, a bit of a recap of what we have seen in the previous months and years, because the concept of collections is kind of important for what I'm going to talk about now, which is um, execution environments. Execution environments is, is fairly new. I don't know how many of you heard about it, but uh, that's actually what I want to spend the majority of time today. And again, I want to start by uh, recapping a little bit and say, okay, what is actually the problem we have been seeing and we are trying to solve here? And um, as you certainly know, if you are advanced with the Ansible, is that many modules have Python dependencies. Again, picking on my cloud providers, uh, they typically want you to install some additional Python libraries uh, to make those modules work. And one way to do that is to use Python virtual environments. The, the nice thing about them is they are easy to set up. You can have multiple different versions of Python on your same machine. You can install different libraries in different environments. Um, you can even install different Ansible versions in different environments. So it's, it's really nice and really cool mechanism to experiment with different versions 
but without the need of having VMs or containers, it's just a different directory tree. On the other hand, Python virtual environments are not an Ansible feature. Actually, they have nothing really to do with Ansible. It's a Python thing, and it was actually de designed and developed for Python developers. So they can use different Python versions and uh, can experiment with different versions. So virtual environments are not really designed to be portable, for example. Of course, you can install them on many machines, but if you have uh, different, I don't know, developer machines or different uh, environments like staging, QE, production, development, you basically have to manually make sure that they are all up to date, that they are all consistent. Um, typically, virtual environments are not maintained by the operating system. So if your distribution brings out a new version of Python or a new version of a Python module, uh, it doesn't automatically update your virtual environment. So you have to also do that on your own. But there's a lot of um, maintenance um, effort uh, to maintain your Python virtual environments. And that's actually what we are trying to address here. We want to give you a uh, capability to make your Ansible playbook uh, reliable, predictable, and scalable. So you want to be able to have the same playbook on different machines. Uh, maybe like me, you have multiple computers you want to use, or you have a, a team you're working with and they, they all develop on Python, uh, sorry, on Ansible. Or like I said, you have uh, QE staging production environments and you need a mechanism to make sure that they're all using the same combination of uh, Ansible, uh, of collections, of uh, Python dependencies maybe even additional packages you need to install for your, for your playbook. But we want to uh, package all that in a standardized way. And of course, the standardized way these days is using container technology. So under the hood, we are basically using uh, Docker and Podman and you know the standard container technology. But we are trying to hide this as much as possible from you. So, if you don't want to know too much about containers, we are actually having tools which make your life easier. And I will introduce them in a minute. But of course, if you really want to know what's going on on the hood, um, everything is open source. So you can dig as deep as you want and go as deep as you want to better understand how everything works. Uh, so what we are doing in Red Hat, we are basically using uh, the uh, universal base image, which is a RHEL 8 uh, container image. You can actually use them yourself. Uh, they are available for everybody. You don't need a Red Hat subscription to use them. And they are basically a stripped down container image with RHEL 8. And then we put Ansible core on top and uh, Python and maybe some dependencies you might need. And then, of course, the Ansible collections you need to use. Uh, you don't have to use the UBI. You can, of course, uh, use whatever you prefer as your distribution underneath. I'm just saying that because that's what we are using when we build our execution environments. And again, going a little bit deeper, uh, again, keeping the example with Red Hat, uh, we have the UBI 8, uh, which is based on RHEL 8. Uh, we have Python 3.8, we have Ansible Core 2.11, and then, of course, the collections you want to have on top. And again, this is, of course, just an example. In your case, you might have a completely different list of collections, but you can see it's relatively easy to build, and it's not really rocket science. It's just, you know, using existing technology uh, we are using these days uh, and uh, nothing really new. But to make your life easier and uh, to say you don't have to really learn all these new tools if you don't really want to, we have some new tools to um, simplify the interaction with execution environment. And the first tool is, of course, you need something to build these execution environments. And it has a very simple name. It's called the builder, Ansible Builder. And uh, what does this tool? It's um, a Python tool, and you install it uh, like you always do with pip if you want to. And then it uses an input file, which um, 
as we usually have it in Ansible, it's YAML. So uh, this YAML file describes your um, execution environment. You put uh, uh, the Python dependencies you might have. You put in um, the RPM packages or other packages you need in your execution environment. And then, of course, the collections you want to add. And it builds the, the image for you. And then uh, you can uh, uh, upload that to a, a container registry or share it with your peers and um, um, make this image uh, available to others. And again, the, the big advantage is it combines everything you need to run your playbook. So it should give you predictable, reliable, and reproducible results wherever you run the combination of Ansible playbook and uh, execution environment. So this very simple workflow is, uh, is like this. We uh, use Ansible Builder. Uh, we have the input file, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, we build the execution environment, which you do locally. Um, and then you publish it. You push it into your container registry. Or maybe if you're a Red Hat customer, you use your private automation hub, which comes with a container registry. Um, I'm going to use GitLab in the demo. So any container registry is fine. And that brings us to the first part of the demo for today. Um, so you should see my, my terminal window. And the first thing I want to do is I want to install Builder. I create a new virtual environment for that. And uh, just do a pip install Ansible Builder. You will see it's a very small piece of code. So it just takes a few seconds, and it's already installed. I created some uh, um, example project. Uh, the link was in the slide, and uh, we will share this with you, of course. Uh, so I created a very simple example to demonstrate to you how this works. And the first thing you will see is there is an, uh, a definition file which um, describes how the execution environment will be built. So there is an, a Galaxy requirements YAML, which uh, contains the list of Ansible collections you want to install. You can have a Python requirements TXT for your Python dependencies if you need to install something additionally. And there is a system bindup TXT, which can be used to specify um, additional packages you want to use. And then, of course, you can also run commands during uh, building your uh, execution environment. I'm using basically the example, which is uh, in the documentation. So I, I kept it intentionally very simple. But you can see you can tweak um, how the, build, the image is built to your needs. So let me quickly show you those files. The requirements YAML should look very familiar because that's what you probably already do when you build your collections uh, requirements. And so it's the standard format. And uh, Builder is, is using the same syntax. So you could actually just copy your requirements files you might already have, maybe consolidate them, and put them in here. I don't install any Python dependencies. I don't need anything. So I just have an empty file. And for the uh, bind app, I just put in a link for the documentation, which gives you some examples. But in my case, since I'm just using those two community uh, collections, I don't need anything. And building this uh, image is also very simple. We just call it with the uh, command build. You specify the file we are using. There is one thing I would um, add or recommend to add is the verbosity level. By default, Ansible Builder will not give you a lot of details. Uh, it's a relatively quiet tool. Um, if you're like me and you want to know what's going on, uh, you might want to use the dash v3 option because that gives you basically all the gory details. In my case, that should also just take a few seconds because there haven't been any changes. And I was, of course, running this before. So everything is already built and already there. There is no configuration file or anything for Builder itself. So as you have seen, it's very simple uh, to run. And then uh, the next step would, of course, be something like pushing this into a registry 
or maybe uploading it to your private automation hub if we have one. Um, I already did upload mine to the uh, GitLab registry, so I will skip that for now. Um, so coming back to the slides. The next thing, of course, what we need is we need to be able to execute our playbook in uh, such an execution environment. And the tool for that is the Ansible Builder. And of course, I put all the links into the slides. So uh, when we share the deck with you, um, you, you don't have to write them down. Uh, so, you know, make it easy. But you can see it's part of the GitHub Ansible upstream community project. So everything I'm talking about here is part of the Ansible upstream community efforts. So what does the navigator do? It gives me the capability to run my Ansible playbook in uh, you know, development testing stages, or of course also when I'm deploying it in production in a, in a larger environment. And um, it basically gives me the predictable, reliable, consistent behavior of my um, Ansible playbook. And of course, Ansible Navigator is also um, um, written in Python. And although I wrote here Ansible Contro Automation Controller, I just realized that I, I didn't want to put that here. Um, but uh, you can use that, um, like I said, pretty much wherever you want. So this extends our workflow from before. We uh, build our execution environment with Builder, which builds it locally. We push it into our registry. And then Ansible Navigator can actually pull it down from the registry if the image is already, or if it's not already uh, locally available. And then it will, is able to run your playbook together with the execution environment in a predictable, reliable, portable, and scalable way. And when we go a level higher, we basically say, okay, now um, we build this, we push it into the registry, but now the big advantage is if I have different environments like staging, development, production, or I have different clusters, or um, maybe you know air-gapped environments, customers or partners, or somebody else I want to make this available to, I pretty much know how the combination of Ansible playbook and execution environment will work because it's always the same. It's consistent and uh, we can uh, really um, use this to have predictable and reliable outcomes of our Ansible playbooks. And um, like I said, this is the big difference uh, compared to before because before I needed to tell um, my user how to build the uh, Python virtual environment, what needs to be installed, maybe even specify which versions need to be installed. Um, so that was you know, quite tedious and execution environments really make that much easier. And of course, I also want to show you that. So going back to the terminal and we uh, create another virtual environment. Just call it navigator, and we switch into that uh, environment, and we use again pip install Ansible Navigator. It's a little bit larger compared to Builder, but you can see it's still a relatively small piece of code. Uh, it just basically uh, adds additional capabilities for the support of execution environment. Um, but you know it's a, it's a relatively small piece of code. Um, again, going to my um, Git Navigator. So Navigator is a little bit more powerful, I would say, compared to a Builder. So it does actually have a configuration file, and I would actually uh, recommend to create one because it really makes your life easier. Uh, so I have an example here. Um, there are many more configuration settings. I just uh, chose basically what I'm using on a regular basis. And I wanted to very quickly go through the settings we have. And let's start with the inventory. So instead of always using dash I, for example, to point to your inventory, you can put that into your configuration file, 
Um, and if you're like me and you use a static inventory file during development, you don't have to specify it all the time. You can just keep it there. Um, Ansible Navigator also has a, a, a lot of lock uh, details, um, especially in the beginning. I found it very helpful to set the lock level to debug and point it to a different directory. By default, it will put the locks into your working directory, which can be a bit annoying in my, I, in my opinion. So I want to have them somewhere else. And I want to have the debug level because the debug level really tells me a lot about how it's working under the hood. It even shows you the podman commands it's executing uh, to start a container image with all the command line switches and all the uh, pre-set up tasks and everything. So it's quite handy if you want to understand better how it works under the hood. Another nice new feature is you can have an artifact collection. So typically when you use Ansible Playbook and you, you have the output on your terminal, you close your terminal and the output is basically gone. If you enable the artifact collection, you can actually replay a playbook at a later point in time. And you can actually see what the playbook uh, was basically doing. You will see uh, the tasks which were executed, uh, the parameters, uh, the, the return values, everything. That can be quite nice if you want to go back at the previous playbook run and see uh, what, what was the behavior in the previous run, what is it doing now. Um, I have it disabled here. Um, but uh, it's still a very powerful feature and definitely worth um, spending some time to play with. Coming to the uh, relevant parameters for execution environments, we have uh, the pull policy. In this case, we're saying only pull down the image if it's not already available locally. You could, for example, say that to always. So whenever you run it, it will check for the latest version of the image. And if there is a newer one, it will pull it down. Um, I know that I'm not changing the image that often. So I keep it as missing and pull it down basically manually when I, when I really have to. Um, so then you're pointing to the image, uh, which is the execution environment, which I built before. And as I said, I already pushed it to the registry, so it's already available there. Another nice feature actually is, remember we are running in containers. So the container by default will not see your environment variables. Uh, but sometimes if you're like me, uh, you use the environment variables to specify the credentials for your cloud providers or other connection details. And uh, you can actually tell the Ansible Navigator to pass these variables into your execution environment. So that can be uh, quite handy to you know, make the, those environment available, environment variables available within your execution environment. So that's an example configuration file. As I said, there are many more settings. They're all documented. So I just wanted to pick a couple of things which I thought are worth mentioning. When we start Ansible Navigator without any option, we actually see a little welcome page. So it starts in an interactive mode and it gives us some details about uh, the feature it provides. Uh, a nice feature is, for example, I can check which collections are actually available. And again, these are not the collections on my host, on my on my workstation, these are collections within the execution environment, which might be completely different from what I have installed on my uh, workstation. So this can be a quite interesting and, and powerful feature to understand what is actually in this particular execution environment. And you can see here, I'm experimenting also with my own collections. I have the community crypto in general installed and also AWX. Uh, which is uh, quite handy if you want to automate your uh, AWX setup. But you can also go deeper. You can say, what is actually in community crypto? So you can also dig into that. And you can even go again one level deeper, deeper and say, OK, what is actually um, certificate complete chain doing? And we have the documentation available as well. 
And again, that's the documentation of that particular connection in my uh, execution environment. So I'm not by accident looking at a different version of the module. Uh, I'm looking at the documentation for the module, which is actually installed in the execution environment. Um, we can also browse the documentation. So if I, for example, forgot what were the parameters for YUM, um, it will give me the documentation for that as well. And uh, you can browse your inventory. You can check which uh, execution environments are locally available. I can actually quickly do that. Um, and in my case, like I said, I'm experimenting a lot. So there are uh, a couple of different execution environments installed on my machine. And you can look into them as well. And uh, I already mentioned the replay feature, which uh, if you enable the artifact collector, allow you to check what you did in a previous run of an Ansible playbook. Of course, we also want to run something. And um, we could say run this HTTP YAML. Um, Ansible Navigator is actually using the familiar command line switches from Ansible Playbook. So you can still use your dash i for inventory, dash l for limits. All the um, Ansible Playbook parameters you know and love are still available. Ansible Navigator has, of course, a lot of additional command line switches. But it also you know, inherits the, the switches you are familiar with from Ansible Playbook. So except for the run in the beginning, where I'm basically saying I want to run a playbook, um, there are no new parameters I really have to learn. I think I need to specify a user, otherwise it won't work. Um, by default, again, we are going into this interactive mode, which is probably something new. Uh, so we see there's only one play in this playbook, so we can go into that. There are three tasks in this playbook, but what is new now, I can actually go into the task, the first one obviously gathering facts, and I actually can see all the facts which have been collected when running this playbook. So I can scroll down and see everything uh, which was collected uh, during this uh, run. And then I can do the same for the next task, which was installing uh, Apache. So I can see everything, the input parameters, the output parameters from that particular task, which I think is a, is a very cool feature and makes uh, Ansible Navigator very, very handy and very nice to um, you know, run your playbooks and see exactly what they are doing, particularly when you develop something and you do a lot of tests. You can actually even say rerun this same thing. So I don't even have to go back and, and leave Navigator. I can just run the same playbook again from, from within Navigator. Um, but we can also actually behave, uh, simulate the old behavior. So you can say run this with standard out. And then you can actually see this looks very, very familiar. Um, so you could actually even tweak uh, maybe with some helper script or with some alias magic, Ansible Navigator to really look like Ansible Playbook. So if, if that's what you prefer, that it really looks like the old way, uh, that's also possible. Um, I wanted to also show that we can also do that here. We can actually switch to standard out mode. So we can uh, see that in Navigator as well, and then go back to the interactive mode. We can uh, jump into the log file. Uh, my log file is set to debug level and append, so it's rather big. So this takes a few moments to pass. Um, but we can actually see also the log output here. And like I said, mine is set to debug. So don't be confused about the uh, uh, 38,000 lines of output um, because you know it's it's a debug level and I'm like, appending the log file. So it continues to grow over time. But as I said, it, it's very powerful because like, um, like you can see here, it even shows you how it's calling Podman. So if you really want to see what's going on under the hood, um, everything is in the debug level of the log file. 
There are, of course, also a couple of other things you uh, have to maybe keep in mind. As I said, we are running things in a container. So what Navigator does for you automatically is it volume mounts your current working directory into the container. So everything you have here in your current working directory is automatically made available within the container. But if you have something in a different directory, uh, you can use, uh, for example, volume mounts. Uh, Ansible Navigator provides um, um, the capability to say, I want to mount a certain directory into my container as well. Although I would um, you know, recommend caution with those kind of advanced features because that makes your execution environment uh, less portable. But maybe if you're just debugging something or test something, it might be uh, quite handy um, when you go closer to make something production ready. You should probably stop using volume mounts because you you make your execution environment less portable. Um, one thing I found nice and handy is uh, since we are volume mounting your working directory, if you play with things like collections, um, the collection might not be in your execution environment. And maybe you don't want to in, uh, create a new execution environment every time you, you test something. So since we are forwarding your, your working directory, um, I think this will fail, yeah. <laughs> I'm experimenting these days with uh, my private automation hub, so I have to specify server URL, but then it should work, yeah. Uh, so it, it automatically, like I said, makes a, a volume mount. So if we do Ansible Navigator, and then we do collections, we can actually see that the new collection is now available within the execution environment. So this can be a, a quite nifty trick to, um, you know, if you experiment and develop and you don't want to build a new execution environment just because you made a tiny fix in your collection, uh, you can do it this way as well. Just make it available in your current working directory. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to show about Ansible Navigator. Like I said, it, there are many more features, but uh, there's only so much time. And um, I also want to spend a few minutes uh, on some other topics uh, before we are wrapping things up. Um, because one thing I wanted to spend a minute on is I, I get this question a lot. And I thought maybe it's also interesting for the audience here uh, to see what is actually the difference between AWX and the Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform. And um, just to basically recap, I, I hope you all know that, but I just want to make sure in case somebody hasn't seen this before. Uh, what we as Red Hat are doing is we are looking at the open source community projects. And as you all know, there are millions or billions or trillions, nobody really knows, right? And we try to find the ones which are interesting for enterprise customers, or maybe the customer points us to something and uh, we are looking into it. And then we are either you know, contributing to the uh, upstream project, or in some cases we are uh, actually driving the upstream project, but everything we do is open source. And uh, based on the upstream, we, we call it upstream uh, project, we build what we call a downstream product. And the product is basically what Red Hat customers have available and it's basically you know, around support, certification, uh, testing, training, documentation, additional security checks, and all those kind of things. But we are really developing in an upstream first model. So these are not forks or anything. When we find a new bug or implement a new feature, it's first in the upstream project, and then it trickles down into the product. And uh, this, of course, also applies to Ansible. Uh, so we have the Ansible Upstream Community Project, and we build, based on that project, uh, the Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform. And when we are actually comparing the two, 
um, it's actually the automation platform is much, much more than just AWX. Um, for those who, who are, you know, in a little bit in the Red, Red Hat ecosystem know that we uh, used to have a product called Tower. Uh, we don't do that anymore. We actually even renamed it. It's now the automation controller and we even broke it up. So what you see with AWX is what we build automation controller from. So it's the same source code, it's the same license, but um, it's basically differently packaged and made available to customers. And uh, another important component is execution environments, which we spend the most part uh, of today. But again, as a Red Hat customer, you would have access to supported and certified execution environments. And if somebody um, is waking you up at three o'clock in the morning, you can open a call with Red Hat and uh, um, shout at somebody to, to get it fixed. But again, there are more components. There's uh, the automation hub, which I quickly mentioned. There's also a services catalog and certified collections and Red Hat Insights for Ansible. So the short answer is AWX is just one component of um, the automation platform, but everything we do is open source. We have seen Navigator and Builder is part of the uh, um, Ansible community, GitHub project, um, everything else as well. Uh, services catalog is Galaxy NG, so everything is uh, as part of the up upstream project. And with that, I'm basically at the end of the uh, slides and the presentation. And uh, I always appreciate if you have a minute uh, to give me some feedback. Um, it's just basically three questions about the presentation and the content. Uh, so if you have a minute and um, could uh, go to this link and um, provide me some feedback, that's always very much appreciated. But of course, I want to give you some time to also ask questions here live. Um, I don't know, do you stop the recording before questions or do you want the questions recorded? Uh, I think we will record them. So okay. at, at least my question, uh, I want to have recorded. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that everybody who don't wants to be recorded can can join in after me. Uh, here's my very first question. In the beginning, you stated that the Ansible container is based on UBI. As far as I know, the, the last time. Pardon? The one we ship. So if yeah, you yeah. Um, use what we are providing, they are based on the UBI, yes. Okay, what what about the, the upstream project? Do you know what's there under the hood? It's Fedora, CentOS? It's CentOS. CentOS, So okay. actually the Ansible builder, when you um, build your first image, the builder mm -hmm. is actually downloading a, a container image as well. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, based on uh, CentOS. Oh, okay. Cool. So, Sorry. but again, if you build your own, you could uh, use whatever you prefer. Uh, you yeah. don't have to use the UBI. Oh, okay, so for the Ubuntu Debian fraction, there's yeah. also the possibility to do the same. Or for me, who wants to have Fedora or CentOS, I can use this one, etc. Yeah. Okay. So the Ansible Builder has a built-in default. If you don't specify what you want to use as a, as a, a you know lower level of your container, mm -hmm. uh, so it downloads an uh, an image from Quay. Um, but again, like I said, you could technically use whatever you want if you don't want to use uh, RHEL underneath or CentOS or Fedora or Ubuntu or yep. SUSE. <laughs> Did I miss something? <laughs> okay. And then there was a second question uh, with regards to the behavior in AWX and stuff like this. So as far as I know with AWX, 16 and also the currently released uh, Ansible Automation Platform 2.0, was it? Yep. Yeah. Uh, there's also support for the whole uh, builder execution environment behavior. Uh, yep. What do I need to do in my Git repository so that AWX understands which requirements are used and uh, which dependencies must be installed? Is it only placing the requirements YAML in the repository somewhere or is there some documentation how it should look like? 
Um, so, as you know, I don't really play a lot with AWX. I'm busy mm -hmm. enough <laughs> with doing things with uh, the Red Hat product. Uh, so, we uh, have um, Ansible 2.9 as a compatibility. So, if you have an execution environment for 2.9, it basically is what, what you will or have done in the past. So, mm -hmm. uh, it still has uh, the capability of looking into an uh, collections requirements YAML and, and pulling that in automatically or a, okay. a role requirements YAML. Um, however, I would probably encourage you to uh, start looking into execution environments and put everything in there mm -hmm. because that gives you a more predictable and uh, a reliable uh, outcome, right? Because everything is your execution environment and then it, it's independent of where, of where you're running it. Uh, if you run it on a different version of AWX, maybe on somebody else's AWX, or if you run it eventually on a Red Hat Ansible automation platform, it will always behave the same because yep. the execution environment will always be the same. Mm -hmm. And you basically, in the job template, which you define, you're pointing it to the execution environment you want it to use. Okay. And then there's my last question. <laughs> um, with Ansible 2.10 and 2.9 and before, I was able to to have some kind of bastion host. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it now needed that this bastion host is having Podman or Docker installed on it, or is it only on the control node? That's a very good question, and you know what the thing about very good questions, right? Yeah. 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 I don't know. <laughs> Because the thing is, um, uh, and we had a webinar about that last week, uh, with the automation platform too, we deprecated the isolated nodes, but the, mm. the replacement feature is not ready yet. That's uh, the automation mesh or uh, receptor, so yeah. GitHub Ansible receptor is the, the future. Um, but um, I don't have a lot of details about that, uh, what, what's, how it's going to work. We will learn that in the next couple of weeks and months. So um, when we have, or when I have a proper answer, we, maybe we can have another webinar about that. But right now, um, I can not really answer that question, sorry. Yep. Uh, so hopefully we can clarify this until. But, I mean, my, my gut feeling would be that it probably also, you know, transfers your execution environment because you know that was the whole idea of yeah. making them portable and scalable. Um, so I would expect that you will need Podman to execute your execution environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but how it's technically done? Will the installer somehow take care of this? Will you have to do this manually? Will there be some magic for that? Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, not not a problem. Uh, hopefully, we can clarify this until January, I think, because in, in January, I wanted to, to do another automation yeah. Uh, webinar. Yeah, cool. Then that's it from my side. Thanks a lot. <laughs>